Good evening and welcome to the 2016 Clinical Social Justice Keynote Lecture. My name is Marina Evans Arthurs and I am an alumni of UMBC and I'm so honored to be here with all of you this evening as we continue to celebrate both UMBC's 50th anniversary and also the Women's Center 25th anniversary. Before we begin tonight's program, on behalf of the Women's Center and Student Life's Mosaic Center, I first want to recognize and thank the following co-sponsors whose who support has made CSJ possible. Residential Life, the College of Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences Dean's Office, the Honors College, the Office of Institutional Advancement, LGBTQ Faculty and Staff Association, Off-Campus Student Services, Women Involved in Learning and Leadership, Go Will, um, student Disability Services, the Sociology, Anthropology, and Health Administration and Policy Department, Media and Communication Studies, Modern Languages, Linguistics, and uh, Intercultural Communication, Language, Literacy, and Culture, and also American Studies. As many of you know, the theme of this year's Critical Social Justice is home. For some, Home is a place that gives you a sense of belonging and purpose. Home can be a safe space where you feel loved, welcomed, and allowed to be vulnerable without judgment. Traditionally, and often narrowly speaking, home has been constructed of four walls and biological family, or specific geographical boundaries. But there are so many complexities surrounding this concept of home. For some of us, the home we are brought into as children is not and may not ever be the place that I just described. Personally, I grew up in a rather challenging home. Between turbulent relationships between my divorced parents and a sibling that struggled often with substance abuse, my home was often absent of security and understanding. It was chaotic and it was suffocating and it was absolutely unbearable. All of my extended family lived several states away and I felt increasingly isolated and estranged. So I left home when I was 16, and I was taken in by two families of close friends. In both homes, I was met with love and compassion and understanding. But while I was so grateful for the shelter and companionship of these families, I still never quite felt like I was at home. After the birth of my son, almost 10 years ago, I realized that home was a constant cultivation and process. My hope for home was not what it used to be, but my hope was for what it could be, for what it could become. Home became my village of neighbors and fellow parents who I could trust and share mutual struggles as well as mutual achievements and accomplishments. Home became UMBC and the supportive programs like McNair Scholars in places like the Mosaic Center that I hold deeply in my heart. Home became the Women's Center, filled with other fellow moms just trying to make it through yet another semester. Here at UMBC, only just a few years ago, I found an amazing community of like-minded individuals who were so supportive and essential to my growth, my feminism, and my activism. All around me, I began to see that I was not alone in cultivating these connections and building a home outside of the traditional paradigm. Many of us in this room have started to broaden the <coughs> narrow scope of what constitutes and what represents home. And we all have the ability to resiliently create an alternative system and spaces of belonging. And I think that that is so incredibly beautiful. Throughout tonight and for the rest of critical social justice, we want you to consider where you have found your home. And wherever you find that home, may you find community, and may you find healing, and the ability to live authentically and to love in abundance. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Daniel Lilly, I'm a Gender and Women's Studies major, and I am a student staff member at the Women's Center. Critical Social Justice, meaning both the week-long programming initiative you're attending right now, and the framework for understanding our world and the structures that build it, is at its core an interdisciplinary concept. 
critical social justice meets at the intersection of all aspects of our lives, including who we are, where we are, what we look like, and how we navigate social and physical space. Tonight's keynote speaker, excuse me, tonight's keynote speaker, Leah Lakshmi Piefsna Semarasina, reminds us of how our lived experiences provide an essential foundation for engaging in social justice in meaningful ways. In her memoir, Dirty River, she shares her personal roadmap for traversing spaces and creating communities on her way from leaving one home to finding another. In an interview last year, Leah said, the body is the only thing I'll ever own and it's on loan. We carry home in our body's memories, in our cells, in our bones. Her comments were in the context of speaking about the experience of diasporic people forced to leave home because of, the, because of genocide, war, and imperialism. But I think this is a truth I find in myself as well. As a fat, queer, trans, mentally ill person, I've spent a lot of time learning how to find home in my body. I think a lot about how my process of coming home is so privileged by my whiteness, where I live, and with whom I surround myself. And yet it remains true that this is the only body I'll ever have, and it won't be here forever. As Maureen said, some of you at UMBC can relate to Leah's story of leaving home. For many, theirs is a story of finding safety in a home that is not safe. For others, coming to UMBC is their first experience of leaving home and learning to build a new one. This year's Critical Social Justice offers space to rethink how we make meaning of this concept of home. And all of us have something to gain from the opportunity to think about the infinite ways to leave, find, become, and embody home. Finally, I'm excited to introduce our keynote speaker. Leah Lakshmi Piefsna Semarasina is a queer, disabled, femme of color, poet, performance artist, healer, and activist. Much of Leah's work focuses on people and conversations that are often underrepresented, including disability justice, queer and trans people of color, and abuse survivors. In addition to her award-winning poetry books, she has also recently published her memoir titled Dirty River, a queer femme of color dreaming her way home. Welcome, Leah. Thank you so much for all of those 20 different organizations on campus who helped bring me here, which often also I'm asked like, okay, so you're this working class raised, queer, mixed, femme of color, disabled artist person, how do you do it? And I'm like, when you come to colleges, it means everybody puts in $100. And that is how it happens. Um, so I want to thank all of the labor that went into creating this space and into creating black and brown and queer and feminist and disabled space on campus, because it's... So that labor is invisibilized and taken for granted all of the time, pretty much, and I want to make that not so. So thank you, David, thank you, Maureen, thank you, everybody at the Women's Center. Um, and yeah, I actually, so when I got invited to come speak, they were like, okay, what do you want to talk about? You're 45 minutes, and I was like, disability justice, healing justice, sounds of color, and I was like, that could be like, you know, a week-long symposium, but we had 45 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna do the best I can, and um, there also will be a lot of room for conversation and interchange afterwards. Does that sound okay? Okay, awesome. So before I get started, I just wanted to begin by acknowledging the Susquehannock and Lenape people whose land we're on, and as some folks may know, in terms of indigenous history on the land that we're rooted on, um, except for the Piscataway Nation, Maryland doesn't recognize any First Nations who are indigenous to this land. Um, and part of that, I mean, the short answer for why is settler colonialism, but the longer answer is that First Nations people in this part of the world were pushed off of this land during violent displacement in the 1700s. And most of the folks who this land belongs to are in Oklahoma or have been dispersed or past this white or intermarried to survive or intermarried black folks and other communities of color. <coughs> Um, I wanted to start with that. Where I come from, partially in Toronto, it's really customary to do land acknowledgement, and it's a way of actually starting to shift what we ground our work in to really think about colonization as not something that happened 500 years ago, but something that's still happening right now. And to really acknowledge that First Nations people are not gone, disappeared, or dead, but actually indigenous nations, as we're seeing in Standing Rock and many other places, are very much alive and are doing work that saves the world for all black and brown white folks on this continent. Um, yeah. Have a copy. It's 
great. Um, <laughs> and I want to say too that you know all of us come from somewhere, and when we're talking about what home is as people who are fighting for social justice, whether we are descended from European, black, brown, or mixed folks, we all come from somewhere. And all of those places have a somewhere that existed before colonization. Um, you know, I know that for a lot of European folks or European descendant folks, there's that sense of like, where do I go that's not, where are my roots that aren't fucked up, you know? Um, <laughs> and I think it's really important, especially in challenging cultural appropriation that often comes out of that place and guilt, to really assert that um, before Europe colonized the rest of the world, it colonized its own people. And there are indigenous and pagan and non fucked up traditions and ancestors that are waiting for white people to claim that are about resistance. As much as we, who are black and brown and indigenous, have our roots that are in us, that are our home, that we carry with us. All of our ancestors are waiting for us to ask them for help and guidance, is part of my spiritual tradition of what I believe. And um, I have like six pages of single space text here, we'll see how much gets in here. But one thing, <laughs> two things that I wanted to start with are that, um, you know, as Daniel mentioned, like I come from a tradition, I come from roots in Sri Lanka, Ireland, and the Romani people who are diaspora sized all over. Um, but one thing that I believe that is that, as Daniel alluded to, you know, there's a lot of us who are not able to stay where we're from, whether it's because we're refugees, whether it's because we're displaced because of gentrification and anti black racism, whether it's because of a million other reasons. But, we carry our people in ourselves and our bones, right? Um, there's stuff that's out there, since it's on Tumblr, which is still a legit form of knowledge, um, that talks about how all of us are made out of the residues of stardust, and all of us have the ancestral land and DNA of all of our ancestors in our bodies. That's something that is with us no matter what happens to us, or no matter how much we are pushed away from those roots and those people. And one, as somebody who is Sri Lankan, and like many Sri Lankans, has been forced away from Sri Lanka because of our 30 year civil war, it's really important for me to assert that as long as I am alive, Sri Lanka is alive. As long as I'm alive, I'm keeping the tradition of Sri Lankan feminism that my grandmother and great aunties did in the 1930s alive in this body. That I'm not an accident, and that my South Asian mixed race queer feminism comes from somewhere. And that's something that's not just up here, that's also in this body that looks a lot like my grandma's body, especially in the butt sometimes. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> the pictures. Um, oh, and this, the second to last cute thing I want to say is that I actually have home tattooed right here. Yes, it hurt a lot. Um, it also, there was one white hippie lady in line at the Trader Joe's who turned around and was like, I get it. Home is where the heart chakra is, right? And I'm just, <laughs> I really am just trying to buy these groceries right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, yeah, 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 heart chakra, totally. Um, so, that's some of the blah 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 to begin, and I also was wondering if to bring all of us into our bodies and to arrive, if you would, can you we do a little woo woo breathing thing for a second? Yeah, okay, you can boycott it if you get it. Okay, it's very simple, there's no way to screw this up. If you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. If you do not feel safe or comfortable closing your eyes in this big room as people, that is smart, you know, probably, so <laughs> do whatever you need to do. But um, if you can, just, if you want to put your hand in your beautiful belly, however, whatever it looks like, it's perfect for you. And just take a deep breath in. And feel yourself get full. When you're ready, exhale, and if you want, you can make a big noise and let go of any crap you're holding you want to let go of. So wait, I'll demonstrate. This is so much better than me just giving you a lot of statistics, right? Um, and I was once at a keynote that the writer, the amazing black queer writer Sharon Bridgeforth did um, when she was speaking at the Butch Voices Conference in Oakland some years ago, where she had everyone breathe and she was like, I just want you to know that when you do that, you prove that at least for this moment, you made it, you're alive, you're present, you're able to keep being present, and you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, and that's something that's always there. It's easy to forget, but it's always there. So thank you for humoring me with the movie. Um, so in terms of home, and we're already probably 10 minutes into this thing, but um, 
So in terms of specifically talking about what home is, I wanted to start out by trying to focus it on my own experience as a disabled then queer person of color and my activism organizing and artwork around that and a lot of other people's as well. And I wanted to try and talk about how ableism and disability is so important to everybody, disabled and non-disabled, when we think about what it means to come home to our bodies, right? And I want to actually start by playing a video clip from Sins and Valid. Um, Sins and Valid is the disability justice performance collective that I'm a part of. We just turned 10, which is great. Um, we just Sins and Valid was started by Patty Byrne and Leroy Moore, who are two queer, black, disabled people with disabilities who basically did a lot to give birth to the modern disability justice movement, which, if folks aren't familiar, is a movement that was really created by disabled, queer, and trans people of color who were sick on the one hand of the whiteness of the mainstream disability rights movement and the single issueness of it, and who were also sick of how able-bodied POC, like black and brown, social justice communities often always forget about ableism and disability and disabled people's bodies and lives. Um, and we decided to do it through performance art, which is an interesting choice, but um, I asked Patty once, I was like, why didn't you just do a workshop? And she was like, you know, I get, I've done workshops, and she's like, you know, I could do a workshop till I was blue in the face, which comes really easy because I'm disabled, you know, and it's okay to laugh. And she was like, yeah, I could do a workshop trying to convince people that our lives matter and that we actually have gifts and brilliances to give all movements. Or I could just do a three minute piece of performance art that fucked everybody up. And that just seems a little bit more time efficient. Um, so I want to play the clip. I want to just tell a little story about my entryway into this collective and this movement. So this the piece that I'm about to show was from our show in 2008. Um, when I when I was watching that show, I was 31 years old. Um, is that right? Something like that. 33. Yeah. Anyway, um, and I was living in Oakland, California. I'd been there for a year. I was in grad school and. I don't know if folks says, I think Oakland for a long time had the reputation if you're a queer trans person of color as like it's the closest you can get to heaven without dying. You know, it's just like, oh, there's like 40 parties a night and it's this majority of people of color oasis and it's everybody's queer and trans and it's incredible. And I was really in the thick of that and I also was really deep in closeting my disability because I just wanted to go out like everybody else and like many, many people, disabled, nerdverse, it's chronically <coughs> ill, you know, not not disabled yet, will be disabled someday, not able to admit or own that we're disabled yet. I was like, I would never have said, oh yeah, I believe this if you asked me, but I had deep in my bones the belief that disability was not cool, it was not sexy, and that actually in order to survive, both really, really concretely and socially, I need to mask all of the disability, all as much of the disabled parts of myself as I could to be able to keep up with the able-bodied and be with the cool kids. Um, so when I saw Sins and Bell was coming to the show, I bought a ticket, I did not tell anyone I was going, I did not bring anyone with me. I knew that I would not be able to explain to a, most of my able-bodied cute pop friends why this show meant something so important to me. Um, and, you know, there's other examples I have down here, and, you know, as I was saying before, like, you know, when I talk about, yeah, most people have some kind of internalized ableism around disability is sad and weak and a fate worse than death and awful, or it's inspirational. And most people be like, oh no, I don't feel that way at all. Those folks are great. But then, you know, just to give one example, you can have in the same breath, um, as white queer disabled writer Anne Finger said about Frida Kahlo, she's like, right, yeah, so many people don't think about Frida Kahlo's disability, even though it's all up in every part of her art and politics and life because vocally or not, I'll say, oh, she can't really be disabled, she's sexual, you know? Um, so, right, so here we are, there I am, um, and, you know, as the disabled Korean <coughs> artist and performer and writer Mia Mingus has said, which I spoke to some people about before, she was like, right, she's like, as a disabled Korean woman, she's like, over and over again, I meet other disabled women of color who don't identify as disabled, even though they clearly are, because it's very dangerous to identify as something when you're already incredibly vulnerable, and because our peoples have often survived by being passed by being or passing as strong and vulnerable and keeping it all together. Is this like ringing bells for everybody? Okay, we're gonna play the clip and then we're gonna talk about home. Does that sound good? <coughs> Excellent. Should we turn? Is it possible to turn the lights down a little bit? 
You know what? It's too. Okay. You ask and you get it. Okay. Great. And I'm not going to explain it much, but I'm just going to play it. Can we bring this out? Is this safe? Are you safe? Are you sufficiently insulated from us, the deviant, the disabled, the non-normative, the crippled, or might you become stained by our leaking needs? Are we the disabled, the unconscious visceral threat to the able-bodied myth of emotional predictability and bodily control? Is that why you settle most comfortably in your mental lazy boy as we labor to shield you from our differences? Is that why you contain us in institutions, police our bodies and movements, abuse us, exterminate us, eliminate us even before birth? Do we frighten you so? Must we frighten you? We concave our chests to hold your projections, cupped repositories for your fear of difference, your denial of your need for help, your terror of being vulnerable. A wise woman once said, fear is behaving as though truth were not the truth. Living requires risk, as does the hottest of desires. We live in continual risk. And tonight, we are coming home. Featured, who is wheelchair using Lowry <coughs> um, You, the genius of the direction and the curation of that piece of performance art, where you've got this voiceover of Patty Byrne, Japanese Haitian performance artist and writer, talking about so many things in two minutes, um, talking about the history of eugenics and the ways in which so many of us are still living in the shadow and have survived the shadow of being bodies that are seen as not normative that need to be eliminated from the planet in order for the rest of humanity to progress. And, you know, a little bit of background, many people when they hear of eugenics, their first thought is the Hitler Nazi empire. Hitler actually learned about eugenics from um, United States white businessmen who funded the eugenics movement had sterilization laws in the books where deviant, disabled, deaf, or I forget, the dissident people could be forcibly sterilized by the state um, for years and years. Even though those laws were taken off the book, we still all live in the shadow of who gets to reproduce, whose body is valuable, whose body and mind is the world designed around, and who is left out. Um, that's my serious hand gesture thing going on here. Um, <laughs> And I think that in terms of coming home, you know, as I said before, so many of us, whether we identify as disabled or not, push ourselves away from identifying as disabled. Um, and that is, again, for reasons of survival. Um, earlier today, when we were hanging out in small group, I was talking about the fact that my mother, who is a working class white and Roma woman, um, who is a polio survivor, and who really only came out to me about being disabled when I was 21, where we were going for a walk, and I was, and she finally was like, you know, I can't really go off the block without being in pain, right? And I was like, no, you've never said that. And I was like, wow, there's so much in her history there of having to compete for jobs and survive. It's really <coughs> deep. And then this is right after the ADA passed, and I was like, are you going to ask for accommodations? And she said, no, they'll just fire me, and they'll hire somebody who's not disabled with a better degree, right? Um, so there's a particular kind of distance in home and being able to claim home when we're taught that this body is not valuable or safe, when we're taught that we have to pass as, as other and as able-bodied as much as we can to survive and to be valued and loved, 
And like all forms of oppression, that affects disabled people, but it also affects able-bodied people because everybody I know who's able-bodied has had some experience of having that back of the head worry about what would happen if I got sick? What would happen if X, Y, and Z thing happened to me? What happens when I get old and I will need care? And there are deep, deep, deep archetypes around care, need, neediness, <coughs> being a burden, being too much, not being acceptable, having to hide, that are in us, and then stretch out to our communities, and then stretch out to how we can imagine communities and movements for liberation. Does this make sense? Great, okay, thank you for listening. Um, it's not all gonna be depressing, by the way, I'll just start off here and then move forward. Um, so, so, you know, we were talking about astrology a lot earlier, and so I do feel like it is relevant to say that I'm Scorpio rising. So what just seems just chill and normal for me is kind of intense for other people, so bear with me. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, police violence against disabled black and brown folks, and um, violence against black and brown, or against disabled folks of color in general. And I also want to talk a little bit about the epidemic of suicides of um, queer femmes in my community over the past year and a half. So do what you need to do to take care of yourself, and if you need to step out of the room or cry or breathe, that is all fine. And I also want to end on talking about you know, the solution part of things, which is like what creating cross-disability solidarity and support for femmes of color means for me in terms of my work for liberation at home. So I want to start out by talking about um, violence against disabled folks, and I wanted to start by showing this image of Mario Woods, a um, black disabled man who was caught killed by the police last year. And as you can see on it, there's an infographic that says that over 50% of people killed by police are disabled. And there are, of course, there is, of course, no comprehensive federal data on you know, the deaths of disabled people of color. But there are a lot of available reports that at least half the folks who are shot to death by police have either psychiatric or physical disabilities or both. Um, so sometimes people, actually I already have a question up here that's how do you join the disability justice movement? So I'm kind of jumping the gun on the note cards. I want to say that there are as many ways, that there's not one national organization that you join. Anytime that you join with other disabled, chronically ill, mentally ill and neurodiverse people and figure out what you need out of the conditions of your lives, that's the disability justice movement. <coughs> Every time you centralize people who are marginalized in terms of our leadership and wisdom, that is the disability justice movement. One really big place that I think really needs to happen in terms of DJ movement and is happening is looking at police violence and where ableism and racism intersect, right? Um, so I was just posting on Facebook the other day, there's, um, you know, this is one of many examples. So something happens where somebody's having a psychiatric crisis, a mental health crisis, a spiritual crisis. People are worried. We've all been trained to call 911. We're taught that in kindergarten. I remember when the cops came to my kindergarten and told them, 911, it's great. When we're in crisis, we do what we know how to do and what we've been trained to do. What we see happening over and over is that when people call 911, particularly on people of color, but also on white people having psychiatric crises, they end up dead, right? And this just happened in Auburn, Washington. Um, this young First Nations woman, mother of two, she was pregnant. So she was suicidal, her friend called 911. She ended up getting shot to death. This happened two days ago. Um, this is a place where that big word intersectionality comes together and we see that over and over again, particularly black and also brown people who are seen as autistic, mentally ill, physically disabled, fat, all of the above, are seen as dangerous to ourselves and others, are seen as people whose disabilities and race make us too dangerous and therefore vulnerable to being shot by police. We can't deal with that without dealing with both of those issues at the same time because they operate at the same time. Um, doing that means that we have to address the militarization of psychiatric healthcare services in this country. The fact that when, you know, and this is a segue, for example, when so many people talk about suicide, we're told, oh, go ahead and call that suicide prevention number. And what so many people who are suicidal know is that we're afraid to call those numbers because those numbers usually call the police on us, which does not help de-escalate anybody who's having a really hard time, right? And often makes it worse. Um, so I wanted to call that movement struggle into the room. Um, I also wanted to start out by, um, this is what happens when, okay, so I loaded my PowerPoint 
And then it erased like six of the images that were the best ones. And I was like, this is like, you know, the NSA is in this country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm kind of making do with the internet. Um, so I wanted to also just really give a shout out to the Harriet Tubman Collective, which is a new collective of black, deaf, and disabled organizers. As you can see, organizers, community builders, activists, dreamers, lovers, striving for radical inclusion and collective liberation. Um, who have come together, um, most of them are black disabled activists who've been active in Black Lives Matter and also in disability justice movements, who want to create work and organizing that can address this epidemic of deaths because it can't keep happening. Um, you can look them up, Harriet Tubman Collective, Tumblr.com. Um, I wanted to name this as a really essential place of disability justice. I wanted to also name that you know, especially as times get harder and as the forces of the state get more weaponized, um, many of us are afraid that if we look crazy in public, we'll get shot to death. Many of us are afraid that if we look crazy or too sick in public, we will not be held by community or by the state. This drives us away from home. And if you know anything at all about disability history, there were laws in the books starting in the Great Depression, you know, the ugly laws that were literally banned disabled people from being in public, um, especially during the Great Depression when a lot of people were panhandling for a living. Again, these are laws that aren't physically in the same way on the books anymore, but we all have internalized the idea of, am I too monstrous, crazy, non-disabled to be in public? If I'm not now, will I be? When will somebody find me out? My idea of creating homes for liberation and homes where we actually can come home is when we turn that inside out and we make spaces, and this is not easy by the way, it's not a cute, you know, not that I think you think it's easy, but it's not a cute sound bite. It's, it's vital and not easy to begin to work to create spaces where we can be loved and seen as our most messy, our most interdependently needy, our most vulnerable, and our most not disabled. Um, this brings me to another segue, which, um, how many people here are familiar with the name Jerrica Bolan or Jerrica? Okay, a couple people. So I wanna actually call her into the room. Um, I can find her here. <coughs> oh, okay. Yep, there she is. Okay, so, um, Sins and Ballad this year, um, I just got back from the Bay Area where we did our 2016 show, which is called Birthing, Living, Dying, Crip Wisdom where we were talking about life cycles as disabled people and what it means to live to get old as a disabled <coughs> you know, person of color and what it means to really share the wisdom that you get from like living and surviving with other disabled people, with non-disabled people. And as we were working on this show, um, Jared Bolan's story was in the news and I was in eight hours of rehearsal a week with other performers and we all kept thinking about her. Um, so for folks who don't know, Jerrica was a 14-year-old black, queer-identified, physically disabled teenager who's living in a small town in Appleton, Wisconsin. And um, she had SMA2, um, which is a kind of physical disability, which is actually not fatal. Um, many, many people, and this came out in our case, many people with SMA2 live to be 60 and 70 and deal with, you know, in pain and, mobi pain and mobility challenges, but have lovers and jobs and friends and lives. Um, Jerrica's case hit the media because um, she basically told her parents that she was suicidal and she wanted to die. And between them and the courts, it was agreed that she would have this great last summer. Um, a lot of the media that hit was about Jerrica's last dance because she asked for a prom. And that she would go to hospice and they would disconnect her ventilator and they would let her die. So when I heard about her case, I actually heard about it through the writing of my friend Sir Rachel Royal Johnson, who's an incredible black disabled um, gender non-binary writer and organizer, where Sarah was just like, you know, this isn't about Jerrica's choice, because I have no idea what she's thinking, but she's like, this is about the fact that all the media around her case is actually calling her decision to die a brave one, and is really cheering her on, and being like, this is so wonderful, yeah. And Sarah was bringing up, we were like, so, if, if there's so many questions to this, and I'm actually going to bring up, um, I think just delete it, hang on, bear with me. Yeah. Um, this is actually a statement on Jerrica's death. Um, she did pass um, last month um, by Not Dead Yet, which is a radical disability justice organization that um, really works against the ways in which assisted suicide laws is, are often used to push disabled people into saying, you know what, fuck the nursing home, I'm going to die. You know, um, which 
happens in a vacuum of like, hey, you know, actually, if you had more care, if you had more support, if you had more accessible world, maybe that wouldn't be the only option. Um, so this is a bad PowerPoint thing, but it's a lot of fun. But some of the things that Not Dead Yet brought up, and that many, many disabled folks brought up as we were watching this happen was actually, um, first of all, SMA2 is not fatal. Second of all, Jared reported was reported to be in a lot of pain, and people were like, you know, that's actually not typical for people with her diagnosis. So there were questions about, is, why is no one looking at the fact that, you know, are her doctors confident? Why did she have 38 surgeries in her young life when that's actually so much more than is typical for anyone with this diagnosis? Was she in contact with any people with her diagnosis who were adults who were like, yeah, I'm having sex, and I'm a professor, and I have kids, and I have all this stuff going on. Um, one of the things that she was reported to say a lot was like, well, I'm having a job now because, well, look at me, I can't really get around. And there were so many adults with SMA2 who were like, actually, you know, I've been all across the world. Like, is anyone giving you those, you know, as Janet Mock called it, possibility models, um, you know, for what it can be to be an adult, queer, black, disabled person? Um, you know, and then the one thing I really want to call out is what the sentence they say were, they say, what might have happened if Jericho's request for a last dance had been met with overwhelming public and media encouragement to live instead of mass depression to die? So I know this is heavy, but I think her life and her death are incredibly important. And pretty much every disabled person I knew was like, wow, just hearing about the story is so intense because it's making me just confirm all of the like microaggressions and macroaggressive ways where we've been told, you know, that oh my god, I would die if I had your diagnosis, or I don't know how you do it, or where we've been told suddenly or not so suddenly that this world is not for us. And the incredible strength and resilience it takes to persist in the face of that, um, as all who we are. Um, and in writing and creating Sins and Ballad this year, you know, I created a piece called All the Femmes Come Back that specifically talked about the pressures that I see femmes and femmes of color in my community, including and especially those of us who have disability space, um, that make us not want to be here, actually. That make us not want to claim the plan of this home. So real quick, and I swear to God, I'm going to like turn this around and be like, actually, there's stuff we can do. I also want to call in the names of some of the femmes in my life who and my communities who have taken their own lives in the past year. Um, this is Tori Davies. Um, she passed in March 2015. Um, she was an incredible black, fat, queer femme from the South Bronx. Um, she was doing performance and organizing when she was 15 years old under the name Afro Titty. She did an incredible amount to do queer black organizing, queer black femme organizing, and um, queer, you know every kind of organizing that intersected with her identities in life in New York City. Um, this is Bryn, this is Bryn Kelly, who is a white, HIV positive, from Appalachia, transgender femme, who was again an incredible writer, artist, organizer, kicked ass for other trans women who were low income in New York, really held firm for Appalachian roots, um, wrote for Pretty Queer as a party bottom, as her, um, as her non-diploma. Um, incredibly fierce woman, incredibly fierce, fierce, fierce writer and organizer and advocate. Um, Meta Arkansas Harris was a white femme from rural Arkansas, small town, who was a photographer, creator, organizer, kicked ass for rural Arkansas queer youth, um, was so southern and so working class white, and um, was somebody who I respected a lot the ways that she went to bat for queer youth of color that she worked with in a legit way, um, that I respected a lot. And um, Dazzle Abergas was a mixed race, trans of color, who I didn't know personally was close to a lot of people in my Bay Area community. Now, these are four people in a year that have some, or known as like artists, organizers, people. These are deaths that have rocked the queer femme communities that I'm a part of. And these are deaths that have made me think a lot about what it really, really means, more than a lip service way, to create homes and communities where we can stay. Um, let me bring it in the home video. And, um, I thought a lot about that, and I'm not going to pretend that I have the magic solution or all the answers. But um, one thing <coughs> that I did want to bring up about femininity and queer femmes and queer femmes in community is that, and this is me not pretending to know what was going inside anybody's head, but that one place that is for the real deal where ableism intersects with our queer, black, and brown feminine bodies is that we often have to be perfect 
hold it all down, hold it all together, do an immense amount of emotional and physical labor. No is not even part of the universe of where we're in. We just gotta hold it the hell down. Um, women and femme people are often <coughs> living in, why am I saying often? We are living in a white capitalist, colonialist, ableist, patriarchal world that says that femininity is too crazy and too much and that we have to never break a sweat and we always have to be there for other people. That leaves very little room to feel like that we can be a mess and we can be like, hey, I'm actually really not okay right now and I can't bake 28 brownies or bail you out of jail or do all the care in the whole world. I actually need to be vulnerable and messy and helped. And, you know, as folks in my community, as there's been an immense amount of death that we've been sitting with in terms of state violence against black people, indigenous stuff, queer femme suicide, so many things in the whole world, um, it's really been like zero to a million real quick 2016, and it will continue to be for a minute. Um, I think it's made me think a lot about the question of what it actually means to create spaces where we can be that raw and vulnerable. And we're also to talk about this is what ableism is. Ableism is there when there aren't spaces in our families or communities to be like, I really need help because the help isn't, either is not there or safe or competent for us because so much mental health care is racist, transphobic, you know, the whole nine, also unaffordable and inaccessible and militarized. Or in a community level where um, one of the last things Corette said was she was like, you know, I. She posted an Instagram picture without makeup, and she was like, I know that, I just want to be like this. I don't want to be ferocious and perfect, and I want to be loved that way, and I don't know if I will be by my queer community. And that's super real, and I want to lift up queer friends, in particular queer friends of color, because they, we are the center of my life. And I also think that there are implications for that kind of pattern for many young people with many identities around whether we are really, it is, as Patty said in that video, whether it is safe for us to come out and come home about all the things we survived and all the things that we really, really need. Y'all still here? Okay, beautiful. Um, hey, and we're gonna stop soon because this is heavy and it's only safe to the hold, but I wanted to, I wanted to actually, I wanted to be really real about that stuff and about that's what home means to me is about creating spaces where we get to survive. And I wanna talk about some of the disabled wisdom that literally is what allows me and other folks that seem to stay. Um, I wanted to talk about this little thing called cross-disability solidarity, which a lot of people are like, oh, that sounds cool, I don't really know what that means. And, um, but to explain it, um, I'm working on a book right now about care work and emotional labor and disability justice. And <coughs> I'm writing a lot about cross-disability solidarity because it's the single thing that has kept me alive. And it's kind of like, I don't know, the magic bullet pill that Big Pharma doesn't know about. You know, I, you know, I, go, to the, I go to the doctor and they're like, oh, you have all these, you know, you've got arthritis in your spine and fibromyalgia and all these things. Why are you doing so well? And I'm like, I have disabled community that shows up for me and we show up for each other. And they're like, mm? and I'm like, right. Like I, you may have read in medical school, oh yeah, peer support's really important, but it didn't tell you that movement building to change the world can save your ass, and that communities that don't change you through your body and your mind can save your ass. Um, so you know, like a lot of things, cross disability solidarity is a fancy word for stuff that a lot of us have been doing our whole lives. Um, I have this little excerpt of just like things I've heard people say that are like, hey, do you have a car today? Can we go to the supermarket? I'm at the bus stop, I heard so bad, can you pick me up? Can I borrow $20 for groceries? Do you wanna go through the action function together? Can I use your ramp? Hey, um, so-and-so needs more people to help do her care shifts. Can you repost the Facebook notes to get people? Um, hey, if you say you're my attendant, we can ride on the access van together and go and you can actually help me into the venue. Um, if I take your manual wheelchair to the shawarma place and fill it up with sandwiches, I can bring it back to all of us who can't walk. I mean, that's something that we've done. Let's pass the hat and if everyone puts in two dollars, we will be able to afford ASL. Um, here's the list of accessible spaces that we all made collectively on Google Docs. Can you be part of my like Mad Map crisis family? Want to lie in bed and watch Netflix together? Do you have an extra bike in it? These are, this is like the tip of the iceberg. And, like many, disability is feminized. Um, there's a ways in which, as disabled people, we're hyper visible and invisible at the same time. It's like a magic trick. <laughs> and all of this work is stuff that people do all the time to keep our communities alive. You know, I mean, I talk a lot about how, for many communities I know, it's like we pass the same $20 back and forth across the movement. 
And for disabled folks, we are able, in community that I've been a part of, we are able to create events and also spaces and homes that are incredibly crowd accessible on almost no money sometimes. Like, I, I made a joke, I'm like, yeah, I can probably teach you how to make a ramp out of some styrofoam and some hot dogs at this point. Like, I, <laughs> I will figure it out somehow. Um, there's my friend's plywood ramp that then caved in. That was, that was a mistake, but no one was on it at the time, so we were like, okay, we tried. Um, and I feel like when we talk about cross disability access, this is one of the things that we're able bodied people are like, you talk about disability science, you talk about disabled wisdom, what does that mean? And I'm like, right, you know, we're still at a place where as disabled people, you know, people are still like, you're a community, not just a bunch of people with health disorders, like what is that? You know, let alone like, oh, you have histories, you have art, you have struggles, you, you, you know how to do things. And I'm like, right, like I, something that in disability community I see us often practicing doing, and I say practicing because we're not perfect and it's not figured out, we practice doing it, is we figure out how to offer each other care from where we are and to not leave each other behind. And every disabled person I know have jokes that's like, yeah, the only people who show up for us are other disabled people. And it's funny because I'm like, I literally could be vomiting for eight hours. But you know, I get the text and I'm like, okay, hold on, I'm gonna take some charcoal, I'll get in the car. Mm -hmm. And there's something really deep about the ways in which when we've experienced bodily difference or mental difference, we know not to shame each other. We know how to ask each other, what do you need? You are the expert on your own experience. We know how to come from a place where asking for and needing help and care is not a sign of weakness or impairment or being kind of like a loser. It's actually something that everybody has a right to. Um, it really asserts a vision of interdependence where it's not about, which is really scary, by the way. Um, it's both deep in the American psyche and the Western psyche and also something that's been true for so many of us that it's really risky to depend on anybody else because that means you're dependent on somebody else and you don't have control. What I see happening in disability communities is that we figure out ways to share our resources and, say, and literally save each other's asses while still getting into their time and not shaming each other for wanting and needing help. Um, what else did I have? Okay, this is, this is the thing I will read off the piece of paper. Um, Cross Disability Solidarity asked the question, what does it mean to shift the idea of access, whether it's around disability, childcare, economic access, or many more things, from an individual chore to a collective responsibility that might even be deeply joyful? <clears throat> what does it mean when my needs or anyone's needs aren't an individual pain in the ass that I should just take care of myself, uh, by myself and not make anyone else's problem? But what if showing up for each other is actually a responsibility and also a really learned skill because we don't automatically know what each other needs or how to show up for each other well. Um, you know, traditionally access is seen as an individual problem for of the individual disabled person to manage. And it really shifts when we shift when in the work that we're doing as folks in the disability justice movement. We actually are shifting that to be like actually maybe it's something else. And I can think of a million of examples of this from um, my friend Marie Erickson, who's a white, queer, disabled, wheelchair using porn star and academic in Toronto, where she filed all, she fired all of her care attendants 10 years ago because she's like, yeah, you know, the state gives you nine bucks an hour to pay for people, and I've got people who are really homophobic and not willing to pay attention to what I needed and not willing to help me and my boyfriend have sex. So I put out a call to have people come through and be like, hey, you can be part of my care collective. I need to get lifted on the toilet four times a day and in and out of bed. And this isn't a like, oh, you poor thing. It's like, oh, this is actually part of building community. There's a lot of organizing that happens in those shifts. There's a lot of people who fall in love, who become friends, build community with each other. Um, that's just one example. I can think of a million examples of the ways in which we keep showing up for each other, where we can keep working to destigmatize and start the really risky work of even thinking about what we would need to do to risk talking about our madness, our crisis, and our traumas with each other in ways that are safe, especially as queer black and brown folks and black and brown folks, period. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna wrap up. This has gone really fast, I hope this is good. But um, yeah, I wanted to say that um, there's an organization I work with, the Allied Media Conference in Detroit. It's an alternative media conference. And one of their principles is they're like, we actually focus on work that's happening in places where there's the least resources, because if you can do it with no money, you can do it anywhere. And I would say that that feels really similar to cross disabled solidarity for me, because a lot of time able-bodied people, you know, one of the many pet peeves of disabled folks towards 
ableist able-bodied folks is we'll be like, okay, hey, there's this event, where's the access info? And then the person goes, oh, shit, we forgot about you again. Uh, well, we tried, but it was really hard. So there's like eight steps, but you know, we could carry you. And then we go, and they're kind of surprised because we're like, no, that's actually not okay. Like, you need to think about this from the beginning and you need to think about why you're not thinking about it. And a lot of why we're often impatient is we're like, we are able, as it is, to make a ramp out of a hot dog. Like, but we are able to, as disabled folks who are seeing from the outside world as having low capacity, we actually have so much that we give to each other and ourselves all the time. And that's not an accident. The wisdom that I'm able to give other folks, especially, including especially younger disabled folks or folks who are new to disabled identity who I mentor and support, it's not, it's not something that's like, in spite of me being disabled, it's the wisdom that comes from what I've learned from living as a trauma survivor, as an abuse survivor with complex PTSD, and as a physically disabled person. It wouldn't happen without that stuff. Um, and I'm gonna end real quick, if I can find this quote, which did not cut and paste into the document, but there's this thing called the internet, so I'm gonna find it real quick if you're here with me. Thank you very much. And then, oh yeah, we're doing, are we doing Q&A up here? Or you want yeah, that's great. That's great. I mean, not that I'm trying to loom over everybody like a powerful god that everybody worships. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, damn, this is hard when you post on Facebook a lot. Just hang in there. Um, um, But um, I'm going to kind of paraphrase what I said, which is um, Amanda, who is the um, next last person whose image was up there if I posted, um, after she passed, there was a lot, there's still a lot of community mourning, but there are some masculine center queers who are writing these very well-meaning posts that are like, Fins, I see you, and I love your five-inch heels, and I love your flawless makeup, and I really respect you. And I wrote this, and I was like, you know what, we're all doing the best we can, so I'm just not, it's just not good enough. But I, sorry, that was me being salty, and I feel about that. <laughs> and I just was like, you know, I think that's really well-meaning. As a, like, messy, disabled, mentally ill femme of color who usually has chicken in her cleavage some way, I don't ask me how it happens. I wrote this thing where I was just like, you know, there's so much pressure on us as feminine people to be perfect and to be flawless, and that's the thing I was saying before about one way that sexism and homophobia affects us. And I just want to say, like, femmes who are out there, I love you when your handshake too much to put on that eyeliner or you don't put it on at all. I love it when you've been in the same sweatpants for a month. Um, I love us when we are sweaty and struggling and all raw edges and when we can't pull it all together and we're trying really fucking hard. I love that part of ourselves. Um, I love all that we've survived. I love us when we're messy. I love us when we can barely show up for ourselves, let alone other people. And we deserve to be loved in those places. Um, we deserve to look at the fact that so many of our queer and trans elders of color um, dance with what's you known as mental illness. When you look at the lives of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who are two often cited like trans femme of color, mothers of the entire queer movement, you know, quote unquote mental illness is really deep in their lives, their trauma resilience, their survival. Um, and that's the kind of thing, I know when Raina Gossett was here two years ago, she talked a lot about what gets whitewashed out of queer history and the erasure of trans women of color's lives. I would say that disability is another thing that gets erased from so much queer and trans history. And we can't afford to let it, we can't afford to talk to forget the fact that the reason why Leslie Feinberg died was from Lyme disease. Um, and that they were deep in the Lyme community for the last 10 years of their life. Um, we can't forget, we can't afford to forget about the ways in which trauma and environmental racism and also just plain living and being disabled are in our welfare lives, not as a deficit, but as a fact of our lives and a point of strength. And this is where I find my home and I thank you for having me and I want to just extend a sincere hope that we all get to continue to create homes where we can be all who we are together. Thank you so much.